God, we thank you for your word and the opportunity to come here and learn from it. And I pray that as we uh, run through some of these verses this morning and, and talk about what's, what's on the outline, that, you, uh, that we would uh, really consider what your words are speaking to us as our roles uh, as saved persons for you today in this world, and, and uh, that we would learn to apply that as we go through our lives. Amen. <clears throat> Um, I've entitled this lesson this morning, Life After Death, which is interesting because we spent a lot of time talking about resurrection last hour. Uh, and while, while what we're going to be looking at has to do with resurrection, it really has little to do with uh, our after this life resurrection. It has a, a lot more to do with the concept that Paul talks about often in his epistles about our resurrected life in these still uh, sinful fleshly bodies. Um, and so to that end, uh, the verse on the top of the outline there, 2 Corinthians 5.15, which I, uh, I spoke about a couple weeks ago, and uh, it says that they which live should not henceforth, from now forward, live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And so with this lesson, I want to answer the question, uh, what is the proper response to someone who has given us life when we deserved death. And I want to walk through a little bit some of the doctrines and the verses that we all kind of nod our heads over, we read through them, we kind of gloss over them, yes, I got that, yes, I got that. And I want to, I want to, I want to look at them again and make sure that we are appropriately applying them and thinking about them to how they relate to our lives as we continue to walk on this earth. Because I think we miss that sometimes. Uh, Justin spoke earlier uh, in the 10 o'clock about the fervor that a lot of us have when we first learn right division. Uh, so, much fer uh, so much fervor that we often uh, make errors in our approach and how we deal with people and how we talk with people. But we're very excited. You learn right division, you get this doctrine, and you're going to go you know, change the world, and you're going to go convert your Baptist church or your Catholic church or whatever it is. You're going to go in there, and you're going to make it all happen and make it change. This zeal that, that Paul talks about is a good thing. He says it's good to be zealous in a good thing. And being zealous about God's truth and, and having, it, having other people see it is a good thing. And yet something happens uh, after, after that fervor is around for a little bit that it starts to kind of wane. And, and, and the fervor goes away and, and we're still thankful for the doctrine and, and we're still maybe learning and growing. But that the zeal to do something about it uh, and make it applicable and real for other people or even in our own lives, kind of, it gets tamed down. And, and we're going to kind of address that a little bit today on, on maybe why that happens and what we can do uh, to, to combat that a little bit. Um, but first, we need to address, readdress the doctrines that are necessary to understand the concept that we're talking about. The first point on the outline I have is dead men walking. We've read these doctrines uh, a lot. We just read it in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 15, uh, where in the previous verse, in verse 14, uh, Paul is talking about, uh, you know, how, how, they, how these people, how these Corinthians should be living. And he says, for the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Then we're all dead is the, is the doctrine that we're trying to, to nail down here. What's he mean? I mean, we got saved. We believe the gospel. Uh, we believe that Christ's death on the cross paid for our sins. We believe we will have eternal life uh, and be justified in it because of Christ's resurrection. And that is freely, not based on our works or anything that we have done, simply because of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ's finished work. And yet he says here uh, that we're dead, that we're dead. Um, and and we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. I just want to point out the verse. Galatians 2.20 is another popular one that most of us have read and have heard preached about and taught. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So this is this, this conundrum, this, this polar opposite, this black and white issue where judicially, positionally, I am considered dead. My old man has been crucified on the cross, and yet I am still alive. I'm living still. So what, what is this conundrum that I, is what I called it on the outline? What, what is this puzzle that, that somehow I'm dead and alive at the same time? What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, Paul out, uh, outlines the doctrine very clearly, step by step, in Romans 6. Uh, and that's kind of the gist of that whole chapter. But we'll just highlight a few of the verses here. In uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 3, 
He asked the Romans, he said, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were, uh, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. And even so, later in the verse, we should walk in newness of life. And so this idea that the man, the person that we were before we were saved, God has taken that person and placed it on the cross. Christ then took our death in, in our place. He died for us. And then because he resurrected, then we also resurrect in the new man. This is, this is the doctrine, the teaching. In verse 6, uh, Paul uses the, the terminology specifically. He says, Our old man is crucified with him, with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, from this point on, we should not serve sin. That's kind of the same point that he made to the Corinthians over there. Drop down to verse 11. And so he exhorts them to reckon themselves to be dead. How? Indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Why? Because Christ has dealt with the sin issue. That's not you anymore. That man is dead. So you should reckon it dead. And you should not do those sinful things. And you should walk in newness of life and behave and act in a, in a way that is... Uh, appropriate for someone who is uh, not a part of sin anymore to act, someone who's alive in Christ, okay? Now, that should bring up a question in our minds, knowing that we are still in these bodies that, though judicially are dead, are still very much active and involved in, in the world around us. And in fact, we can't really escape this body, our soul being inside of it, right? Paul calls it a vessel that we're in. Even though that has been crucified and we have literally been separated spiritually from the body that, so that it does not have the power or the control over us, that doesn't mean that we don't still have to deal with it. And so, of course, in the very next chapter in Romans, Paul deals with this, this uh, split personality problem that he has, right? Uh, he, he has this, this split between his flesh and his old man that is now judicially, positionally crucified with Christ and his new man, his spirit that has been quickened inside of him, uh, that is alive in Christ, fighting against the, the desires and the lusts of his flesh. And so he outlines that in Romans chapter 7. Uh, say in verse uh, 18, he says, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, he makes a distinction. You know, we, we say the body, you know, you know, you are made up of three parts, body, mind, and soul. And he's making a distinction here on what part of him he's talking about. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing, for to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. And this should be the, the issue that, that we face many times over the course of a day, is that we, we learn doctrine as a saved soul, we study God's word, we get the doctrine inside of us, and it works effectually in us to do uh, these things that, are, that are, would be pleasing to the Lord, and yet we struggle. We can't always automatically do it. We can't, uh, we can't always see those things come to pass, and there are times that we do things that we don't want to do, which we hadn't done, which we hadn't said, because our flesh still drives us to do those things. And so there's this battle going on within our person. Uh, drop down to um, verse 22 in chapter 7. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And by that he's not, uh, he's talking about the, the way of God and the way that God operates. In his inner man he delights in that, but I see another law in my members, in his flesh, warring against the law of my mind where he knows the doctrine and bringing me into captivity into the law of sin, which is in my members, in my flesh. And so this is constant battle that Paul describes there, okay? And to the point in verse 24, he realizes the state that he's, that he's currently in, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And he goes on in chapter 8 to, to talk about uh, the answer to that question. But the point here is that I want to drive home is that there, there is this conflict that we have. Uh, the new man that has been saved, our resurrected man that our, quick, our quickening or our spirit that has been quickened and made alive in Christ seeks to do the things of the Lord, seeks to behave in an appropriate manner that's pleasing to the Lord, uh, seeks to do things right for him because of what he did for us. And yet our old man doesn't, I mean, it's contrary to God. It doesn't want that to happen. And so we battle with this every day. Uh, and so we often associate the old man 
with these, these problems of the flesh, okay? Um, and there, there's, this, there's this common answer when you, uh, when you share the gospel with people. It's almost kind of a cliche thing. Uh, if there were a commercial for gospel tracts or evangelizing, I'm certain it would be on there, okay? So you go to share the gospel with someone, and, and uh, you're, you're trying to explain to them uh, their need for a Savior because of their sin. And the person says, well, I'm not that bad. You know, and they give you that, well, I, you know, I'm a good person. And so we all know that we have to show them they're a sinner because they don't, they're obviously not understanding that, you know, they have a sin problem. And uh, that even if you are a very good person, you are still not right with God because of your sin. And this is how we evangelize to people. And for, for whatever reason, I think sometimes after we get saved and we, that fervor that we talked about kind of goes away. And then all of a sudden we kind of get that same mentality put back into our brains. Uh, turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We kind of, we kind of uh, minimize, to borrow some words from psychology, I'm loath to do so, but we minimize and excuse our own actions even after we're saved, just like we might have done before we were saved, uh, which was the reasoning we used why we didn't need a Savior. Oh, I'm not that bad. I'm pretty good. I do a lot of good stuff. I'm not as bad as that guy. Right? We use these excuses. And then as a saved person, we read 1 Corinthians 6, and everybody knows those Corinthians were very bad people. I mean, Paul had to rebuke them in two letters for almost 30 chapters, telling them all the things they had wrong, and none of us are like those Corinthians. So we read chapter 6, verse 9. Paul's exhorting them here, says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? And so he's going to describe these kinds of people that will not be present in the kingdom of God. And so he's exhorting them not to be like them. And he says, Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortionists, shall inherit the kingdom of God. These kinds of people will not be in the kingdom of God. So don't act like those kinds of people. And we all read that and go, whew, good thing I'm not like one of those. Right? We do that. And, and Paul, in almost every letter, gives a list like this. Turn over to Romans 1, the infamous list of inconvenient things for which God gave up the Gentiles in times past. At the end of chapter 1 in Romans, Paul refers to these people in verse 29. He says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit. Malignity, whispers, and by now you've glossed over a list of bad things, right? I don't even know what some of these are. Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, my goodness, uh, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. And you're like, man, I'm so glad I'm not like those people. I mean, isn't that what we do? I mean, we read these lists of bad things like, phew, he, that's why he gave those people up. And think, you know, I'm saved. I don't have to worry about that stuff. And so we excuse these, these works of the flesh, right? Turn over to Galatians uh, chapter 5, where Paul's more specific about it. In regards to calling it, calling those types of activities, those types of actions, those types of behaviors, uh, he calls them works of the flesh, right? Um, what did I say? Galatians 5, verse 19. He says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And he lists them. We've read them already. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. He goes on. Uh, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, drunkenness, revelings, and the such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, they that which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What's my point? Look what he goes on to say next. So he's going to contrast here. But the fruit of the Spirit, the things that come about from someone who is saved, walking in newness of life, their behavior changes, hopefully, when they're uh, not quenching the Spirit and when they're tending to the Spirit and growing uh, in, the, in the Spirit, in the knowledge of the Lord. He lists these things that are quite the opposite. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such uh, there is no law. And we all say, ah, that's me. That feels a lot better. That's what I'm all about. I'm about love and joy and peace. And I've, I can do that. I can, get, I can get that taken care of, okay? And I don't want to minimize that. I really don't. Uh, we're going to kind of, we're going to use this as a springboard to go through the rest of the lesson. I don't want to uh, minimize the importance of the good behavior that should be exhibited 
by someone who is not a servant of sin, someone who is an ambassador of God, God who created good, these things which are an image of the good things of God, I don't want to minimize the fact that we, of all people, should be the ones exhibiting these attributes. That's what Paul talks about uh, in 1 Corinthians 13 when he, when he lists what, and describes very specifically what charity is and how charity behaves and, and, and what it looks like. These are things that we should be striving for every day in just terms of our behavior and our, and our attitude towards one another and other people. Uh, it should be loving and kind and gentle and, all, and gracious and all of these things. I don't want to minimize that. What I want to say with the lesson today is that is the beginning of walking in newness of life. That is the beginning of life after death. That is the foundation of, well, yes, certainly being a member of the body of Christ, you would behave in a way becoming of Christ. Clearly, right? This is how it should be. And yet I think there's more to it that we often miss or overlook, um, maybe not intentionally, but in a protective sense, because in our day and age, in our culture specifically, we live very comfortably and we live, uh, we live in such a manner that it's easy for other things to become very important, more important to us than the things that should be. And so I want to kind of take a look at these desires of the flesh and maybe identify some desires of the flesh that we had not considered to be so before, but may actually be, okay? Uh, if you'll turn to, back to 2 Corinthians 5, which was kind of our theme passage to start out this morning. It's interesting that the very next verse, after he talks about how Christ died for us, and so because we're buried with him in baptism, we're also considered dead positionally, but we now are alive in Christ because we're a member of his body, sealed with the Spirit. And he says that we should not henceforth from that point on live unto ourselves. And then in verse 16, he says, Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. We like to go here as mid ex Pauline dispensationalists to get to the second part of this verse. And we say, we have, known Christ, we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. And we say, see, we don't follow the Lord's earthly instructions to Israel like he, when he was in the flesh. We like to use that verse for that, and I think that's appropriate. But in doing so, we skip over the first part of the verse in the context of what Paul's talking about, which is people not living unto themselves, but living unto Christ. We, sh uh, we now know no man after the flesh. That would include our old man. We know no man, including our old man, after the flesh. And that's something that we would do well to consider as we look at the scope of our lives and what we're involved with, how we behave, what we're striving for, what we set our affections on. We know no man after the flesh, including this one, including the one that we're still walking around in, right? Uh, see it again in Ephesians 4. <clears throat> Verse 22 and 23, uh, Paul says that you should uh, put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, the former conversation, uh, the manner of life, the way in which you, you go about things, okay, conversation. Um, put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. What was it that your old man, your fleshly man, the old man that you still carry around as baggage, what is it that its conversation is about that you are supposed to be putting off and rather being renewed in the spirit of your mind, your soul, where you know the things that are right and you know the things that are of the Lord's and you know the priorities that he has out, set out for us. How, how are we doing with that? Putting off the former conversation of the old man and being renewed in the spirit of our mind. Let's, let's try to get a little more detailed yet. Uh, back to Galatians 5. After Paul lists those works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit, in verse 24, he says, They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh. We covered that doctrine. That's what we've been talking about so far. So they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And there's that evil L word, lusts, dirty, nasty, evil, dark, sinister. Everybody knows that none of us here lust after anything. Okay, fine. Uh, but what about affections? There's a more positive-sounding word, 
Uh, I'm affectionate towards my wife, towards my children. Uh, uh, things that you have affection for. What are things that you like? What are things that you are drawn to? Well, those that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections, which the things that your flesh may like. And it doesn't have to be evil. Do you see what I'm saying? That's the point I'm driving home here. We listed in three verses earlier, we read all these things and we all said, ooh, I'm none of that. I'm not that kind of an evil person. I'm a good Christian. I do good things. I don't do those evil, bad things. Good for you. Okay. But what about the affections of the old man, the affections of your flesh that you're still carrying around with you? What about those? I put on your outline that the old man's affections aren't always those bad works of the flesh, but maybe... Maybe they're just the things that we seek of our own volition. Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 2. So now, now we're seeing that these works of the flesh are manifest. Clearly, the evil, sinful, sinister desires of the nasty you know, flesh that you know, we don't want to associate with all the evils of the world, all the headlines types of things, clearly... We don't want to be partaking in those things. Those, those people will not be in, uh, inheritors of the kingdom of God, Paul says. But perhaps there's more to it than that. Perhaps it encompasses a, a, a greater scope of things than just those nasty bits. Okay. What about in Philippians 2, uh, verse 21? Paul says in verse 20 that he has no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state uh, than Timotheus, who's going to come uh, visiting the Philippians. <laughs> And, and why, the reason why there's no other man like-minded, Timothy's the only one, for all seek their own. And we say, why? Those people? That was not very nice to leave Paul alone with just Timotheus. They're seeking their own. Well, what, what, are they, what are they not seeking? Not the things which are Jesus Christ. Now, I'm hoping that some of these things that we'll be saying here over the next 10 or 20 minutes will cause some friction inside of us okay because what this should be doing is if your old man is paying any bit of attention this morning to what is being said it should really be grading on him okay because you we we have this tendency even as say people to have the self-righteous attitude i'm not a murderer i'm not idolatrous i'm not wicked i'm not all these things that paul listed i'm i i try to be good things i try to be charitable love and joy and peace that's me and what yeah i struggle we all have struggle we have the battle with the flesh romans 7 good thing paul put that in there so we have an excuse Okay, but I mean, but what I'm getting at here that is this is not those things. I'm talking about good behaving, upstanding, polite, normal people who are not like minded because they seek their own and not the things of Jesus Christ. Their own what? Their own, their own affections, their, 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 what, their own wants, their own, I like to do this and there's nothing wrong with this. And this was the main problem that the Corinthians have. I have long said to many people, that if I had to pick one of the groups of churches, one of the groups of people or the churches that Paul writes to, that we are most like today, it's the Corinthians. And you say, why? I am not that gentleman from 1 Corinthians 5. I do not behave like that. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, fine. Maybe you're not like him. But we are so distracted by the things of the world and we are so apt to rejoice in the liberty that Christ has given us, and rightfully so, but we fly off the handle with it. And, and we live in a polite society, and that is what constrains most of us, I might, I might venture forth to say. The reason why most of us have our behavior constrained is not because of 2 Corinthians 5, not because it's what Jesus Christ did for us, it's because we live in polite society. You just don't do that. That will not fare well. That will not look good. People will look, they will not look at you right if you behave that way. It's, it's, it's our polite society, it's our culture that constrains us more often than not. It's not because of our response to what Jesus did, to, did for us and, and gave us freely. And, and then that's, that's where it starts to really grind a little bit. You say, well, what is my motivation for acting right? Is it because we live in polite society or is it because I'm responding to God in an appropriate manner? Right? And this is just behavior. I'm trying to get beyond that a little bit. I'm trying to talk about maybe the things that we think about, the things we give a time and our money and our attention to, the things that we put our focus on, the things that we make priorities in our life that we make God's work 
in Jesus Christ and what he wants to have done and what he wants us to do here for him, make that take a back seat to these other things, to our affections, to what our old man may like to do, even if these things are noble to the world. That's the last point in this section. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. The comment was made earlier that you can do good things without God, and it's true. And yes, God made everybody, made people, and so that's why the things that people deem as good are typically good because they came from the good creator. Paul writes to Timothy here, and in chapter 2, verse 22, all the way down to chapter 3, verse 7, we don't need to read the whole thing. We'll, pull, we'll pick out some things. There's some things in this list that Paul is warning Timothy about, and yet, on the surface, were it not for the warning, would seem to be rather noble causes that people are striving for here. Okay, Maybe in the eyes of the world, maybe in the eyes of other uh, religious folks, uh, flee youthful lusts. That one right there. Now, those of us who have grown out of our youth, we say, of course. We don't make lustful, youthful decisions like we used to when we were young. We're wiser now. We're older. We're not naive. And yet, what does our society really uphold as a gem? Is following the desires of our hearts, right? This is what I was told in school, much to my chagrin 15 years later, when they said, you need to follow your heart's dreams and go get a job and do whatever you love to do. Whatever your heart desires, that's what you should get a job doing. That way you'll love going to work every day. Musicians get paid lousy. Lousy. You can't pay your bills being a musician. And yet, that's what I wanted to do. And so I took their advice. And I wish I would have read my Bible. If you turn back over to Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7, or verse 9, the heart is deceitfully wicked. How's that for getting a paycheck? Okay, go over to Psalm uh, 10. Where's that at? Verse 3. The wicked boasteth of his heart's desires. Perfect, <laughs> right? <laughs> great, great advice. But flee youthful lust is what uh, Paul is uh, uh, exhorting Timothy here to do. And yet our society is something that really promotes childhood. And, uh, you know, don't you just want to be a kid again? And, let you, you know, just let it go. Let's go play in the sandbox and just be free. You know, this stuff is out there. And we, we magnify childhood as if it is the pinnacle of life. And ever since we left childhood, things just got really bad because now I've got to pay bills. Okay? I want my kids to grow up. I want my kids to be adults. And this is the biblical pattern. This is what Paul describes in Galatians chapter 3 and 4 is our positions with Christ as we were once children. Be ye not children anymore. Grow up and be an adult. The position that Christ has given you in him, a responsible position that somebody who knows the will of the Lord and is acting upon that, that's the biblical model. That's just the first one on the list in 2 Timothy. And, of course, he says, follow righteousness, and he lists those things there. Foolish and unlearned questions avoid. That's kind of uh, self-explanatory. Where are these other ones that I'm looking at? Um, go drop down to chapter 3. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Oh, I'm not vain. We're not vain, are we? We don't love our own selves. We live in a very comfortable society, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the things that we spend our money on to make ourselves comfortable because what, is, what does everybody say? What does every psychologist say? You need to take some time for yourself, right? Lovers of their own selves. You need to take some time and love yourself. If nobody else is going to do it, somebody's got to, you know, you need to take the time to do that. They say that. And that's in the list of all of these things we've already read Paul warn about. Uh, in, chapter, or in verse 2 and, and verse 3. And then look down in verse 5. In the list, oh wait, I'm at verse 4. In the list of the bad things, he lists lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And I think to excuse ourselves, we often read that pleasures and, oh, pleasures. He means like those lustful, evil, sinister, nasty things, those pleasures. No, I don't think that's what he's talking about. He's talking about lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasures, things that give us pleasure, things that we have our affections on, things that we say, I really like that. That's what I want to do. Okay, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. 
And I think that's really the point that we're trying to make here, is how many of us are, are appropriately prioritizing the things that we spend our time, money, effort, and, and thought on? Are they pleasures for ourselves, or is it about you know, our love for God? Having a form of godliness. Godliness is a good thing. Okay, uh, exhibiting the characteristic attributes of God in our lives is good and should happen. And this is what we should be teaching our children. Okay, godliness. You need to do this because this is the way that God has made us. And this is a way that is pleasing to God. But there are a lot of people who have that form. And come, we've been describing that, haven't we? Good Christians who obey the law. Good Christians who are polite, upstanding citizens who are not looked down upon anyone for the way that they act or talk or treat people, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. What is the power of godliness? What is, what is that? If you, can, you can look like you're being godly, but what is the power the, uh, that godliness has? And, you know, quite frankly, you know, Paul, Paul, we already looked at it in Romans 6. Part of that power is that you have, because of the gospel of salvation, which, which Paul refers to in Romans 1.16 as the, the power of your salvation, okay, your soul has been separated from the body of this flesh. It has no more control over you. To the extent that you allow it to happen, it has control over you. But because of what you've been given in Christ, because of what he did for you on the cross, you, that does not have to have power over you. You do not have to succumb to that, although we ultimately will, which we use as our ultimate excuse, right? We do that, we do that a lot. It says, from those people, Timothy should turn away. From the people who are acting godly on the outside, but aren't making their lives a response to God truly on the inside, they're the ones that are denying the power of it. And Timothy says, you need to turn away from those people. They act nice. They look nice. They're doing nice things. They act like Christians. They look like Christians, but they don't necessarily think like Christians in terms of their response to God. Does that mean they're not Christians? No. Clearly, uh, we talked about that earlier this morning. I mean, what makes a Christian is not what you do, but you do what you do because you're a Christian. And that is really what we need to think about. Why do we do what we do? And I'm talking about every day. I'm not talking about Tuesday nights and on Sunday mornings. And when you do have that one opportunity at the end of your 5K team run to talk to somebody about the gospel. Okay? I'm not talking about those. I mean, what, why, do we do, why do we wake up in the morning and do this? I mean, if our focus is on God and on Jesus Christ and we're denying the old man's affections and, we're, and we're, although we're acting in a godly manner and behaving, behaving in a godly way, are we lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, are we denying the power that, that God has given us because of our position in Him? It's a good question to ask. So what is the proper response? Okay, so now I've berated us all. We all feel bad that we're all, you know, uh, giving into the affections of the flesh and serving those things and the pleasures of life more than God, even though saved people shouldn't be doing that. Clearly Paul said, okay, so what's the answer, right? Well, the, the proper response is something that I don't think a lot of people want to hear because we, we really, again, I think we're Corinthian, very much so in our thinking, and we really carry this banner of all things are lawful for me. That's called an excuse. Paul has to use that to teach the Corinthians that not all things are edifying. They knew the doctrine that all things are lawful. They knew that. That's why he says it first. You know that all things are lawful, but... What you're missing is that not all things are edifying. Not all things are godly. Not all things are appropriate. Yes, stand fast in your liberty. And so we take that liberty banner and we run with it. And we say, well, you know, I, I'm, at, I'm at liberty to do what I want. It's, it's grace, you know, and I'm a good person. I do, you know, I, I go to a mid ax Pauline dispensational assembly. I mean, how many people do that, you know? <laughs> not many, okay? But... That, you know, Paul's talking about more than that. And, and to take our liberty and use it as an excuse to live our lives in such a way that is not a proper response to the one who gave us life when we deserve death. Whoa! I mean, that'll kind of make you open your eyes a little bit. You know, that'll, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're really trying to serve God, then, then you, need to, you need to realize what that looks like. The proper response is to be a servant of God. Go back to Romans 6, where, where Paul outlined... <clears throat> the, the old man being crucified, walking in newness of life, and the new man now. 6.14, it 
Sin shall not have dominion over you. That's part of that power we just talked about. Drop down to verse 18. Being made free from sin, you became the uh, servants of righteousness. And down in verse 22. Being now, uh, now being made free from sin and become servants to God. Servants to God. That's interesting. I thought, I thought we were free. I thought we weren't servants. In fact, Galatians chapter 4. Surely somebody is thinking to themselves, Galatians chapter 4. How dare, how dare him demean our position in Christ? Because Galatians chapter 4, verse 1 through 7. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, verse 7, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. See, we're not servants anymore. We are full-grown adult sons. True. Point. Okay? Colossians 2, verse 10. We stand fast in this, and some of us have made it through some very tough, doctrinally trying times before we maybe knew the truth. We hold on to verses like this. Colossians 2.10 Ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. Because of your position in Christ, you lack nothing. He's given you all spiritual blessings, made you an adult son, no longer a child, no longer a servant. You are complete in Him. We've been given the manifold wisdom of God on top of that. Uh, look back a chapter in Colossians 1, 26 and 27. Paul says, the mystery hath, uh, which hath been hid from ages and generations is now made manifest unto his saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of his uh, mystery of, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We have the hope of glory. We have God's manifold wisdom and we are privileged to be able to come out here and study it with like-minded uh, believers and, and seemingly solve all of the apparent problems in Christianity just by understanding the wisdom that God has given us in his word. And don't we get a little proud about that? Isn't, I mean, isn't that a good thing? It's a good thing. But doesn't that kind of get to us sometimes? Uh, and in fact, I put that on the outline. It's easy to get puffed up. Uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, that knowledge puffeth up. And puffeth up being pride, which is on those lists, by the way, of all the bad things that none of us are ever. Okay. But we do get puffed up with this knowledge. And we kind of almost take it for granted. Can I say we, we take that knowledge for granted? And so it's easy to get puffed up in our position and our standing. And so we need a better understanding of what the crucified and life, what the resurrected newness of life really looks like. And that, that is what we read in Romans 6, which is being a servant of God. Well, how do we reconcile this, Jeremy? Is this another weird conundrum, like we're dead and alive, or, uh, so, or we're a servant, but we're not a servant anymore? How is this? Well, actually, no, you are not a servant. Positionally, you are a complete, in Christ, grown-up son of God. That's your position before God, okay? And yet, we were bought with a price. Back to 1 Corinthians 6. There's a response, not to earn it. We know this. The position that we have was given to us freely because of our faith. But what's the response when somebody does something for you beyond what you could ever have done for yourself? What is the response? Hey, thanks. Have a great day. Off I go to live my life, which is typically how it is. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Paul's talking about their body which is exactly what we're talking about. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God. And ye are not your own, for ye were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 
We were bought with a price. There was something that happened in that transaction. And though the benefit was conferred on us freely, a cost was paid on our behalf. What should that engender in us who have understood that? You'd think of all people, saved people would, who understand the gospel of the grace of God, would be more humble about how we approach God. You'd think. But we, we get really aloof with God. I mean, he's like, yeah, thanks God, and he's up there. Oh, yeah, he's all powerful. He did it all. You know, give him obedience and, and, and say, you know, say what you got to say to give your glory to God. And yet we go about and live our lives in such a manner that doesn't reflect that. And beyond behavior, because we already know our polite society won't accept anything less than good behavior. And that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the manner in which we walk in this life, not the way we behave, the things that we set our affections on, the things that we focus on, the things that are most important to us, and that, and that is shown you know, by, by what we do. Uh, in the next chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul makes a point here. I suppose it's slightly out of context, but I think the point is applicable. In verses 22 and 23, Paul says, For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's freeman. So someone who is bound as a servant needs to fulfill the duty of a servant. The Lord has given him the ability to be free to do that. Okay. He's been, um, uh, I lost my place. And so likewise, also he that is called being free. So if you're not a servant to someone, God has called you being free. You are now Christ's servant. Why? You're bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. If you are not the servants of men, including your old man, then you need to be the servant of Christ. And you know you've been set free from your old man. We already covered that. So the only reason why you're a servant to your old man is because you let it be so. You don't reckon the old man dead. Okay? But you're bought with a price. And not being the the servant of your old man anymore, you are Christ's servant. Again, this seems contrary to what Paul says in Galatians. Chapter 4, that we're not servants. We're adult sons of God. Well, turn to Philippians. Let's learn the lesson here. Let's learn a lesson from our Savior. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Jesus Christ, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was God. It's not a thing with him that he should be equal with him because he is God. But made himself of no reputation... And took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Despite his position, despite, that his, despite the, 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 the way that he had things before he was a human being, he took on himself the form of a servant to die for all. Okay, he humbled himself to become something that he wasn't before, something of a lesser stature, something of a uh, more baser sort, to go so far as to die and pay for the sins of his enemies. This is what Christ did. And then look back in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Colon. He describes the mind. Let what mind be in you? This is the example that Jesus did. He was something. And he became a servant because that was his duty. Right? It was in the mind of God before the foundation of the world began to pay for the sins of the, uh, of the world through Christ's death on the cross and offer salvation freely by his grace in this dispensation. It was Christ's duty to perform that on behalf of his enemies despite the position that he had as the Son of God. That's the picture that Paul uses for us in this life. Galatians 4, you are not servants. You are complete sons of God, given all spiritual blessings in Christ. That's our position. We have that freely because of Christ. And yet, the exhortation here to have the mind of Christ, of becoming a servant of God, to serve him, because of the duty that we have to perform, the job that God has given us to do, okay? A servant of Christ does not please men. In Galatians 1, verse 10, Paul makes an almost offhand comment. 
For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Notice the contrast. If I please men, I am not the servant of Christ. Let's make this a little more applicable to the lesson. If I please my old man, we, we know no man after the flesh anymore, we learn. But if I please my old man, I am no longer a servant of Christ. I'm serving my old man and not serving Christ. See the parallel there? That's a bit of a spiritual application, but it's appropriate. Okay, if we're going to take on the mind of Christ to become a servant of God, knowing the position that we have with God, then we need to understand this. We do not serve men, we serve God. That includes ourselves. That includes our culture. So that our culture doesn't dictate how we act in this world. But it's our love for, that Christ has shown for us and the love we have back for him, the response that we have back for him because of what he's done for us, that we should henceforth not live unto ourselves, but live unto him who died for us. We should become servants for him, right? So, on a practical level, what does this look like? There are people who ask the question, well, God wants me to do work. God wants me to get something done. What do I do? Okay, this is the wrong question to ask. Okay, asking what do I do, you can ask what, if you can't answer that question, let me put it that way. If you can't answer the question, what do I do? God wants something done, what do I do? If you can't answer that question, then you need to look at this issue a little bit more. The affections in your life, the desires of your old man, the pleasures for yourself, being servants of your old man, being servants of society, being servants of this world, will hide the answer to the question of what do I do? And when you can get past all of that and start putting Christ as the main priority in your life, when you see that your life has now be, been extended for eternity and that the things of this world are no matter or import to that eternity, you start to see very clearly what needs to be done. It's not a matter of what to do. It's a matter of how to do it, how to do it all, how to get it done, how, to go, how, do, I, how do I accomplish all this? I can't do it all by myself. And that, that is what you come to understand. It's not what needs to be done. You get that. You just figure, how can I do it all? And the answer is you can't. But that shouldn't stop you from doing everything you can, right? So what does this look like? First of all, when we realize that this life is of no import, physically speaking, for the life that we have in eternity, you realize that there is a battle going on. And that is the reason why Christ has left us here after we were saved. If there weren't a battle that needed fought, if there weren't anything at all of import in the sphere of this planet, then when we were saved and our old man was crucified, we would have just gone up. He would have taken us there. But he left us here because there's work to be done here that can only be done by us through him, right? And so we have to realize that what that is is a battle. And that's why Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God, right? Great children's lesson. Use these illustrations. We'll dress them all up. My wife teaches the little ones. Yeah. Yeah, okay. But there's an actual spiritual reality here that those of us who are way beyond these childish doctrines would do well to consider. If there's a battle going on, how do we respond? Look at these things that he's saying. Take the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Really? We live in quite a comfortable society. Okay? Now, there are places in the world where you might want armor if you're going to be talking about God today. Granted, does that, does that diminish our responsibility because we're in a place that's not like that? Because we don't fear this building being attacked and burned down, we don't fear our heads being cut off in this country, does that diminish our responsibility to stand up to the duty for which we were called to fight in the battle that does exist? Not one bit. In fact, it gives us more responsibility. Because we aren't facing those issues, ought not we be the ones to step up and do the Lord's work in the freedom that, we've, that we have in the society to do it? Okay? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're not, we're not messing with the physical things, okay, but against principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then he lists the armor of God that you need. This is some pretty hefty stuff. 
loins girt about with truth. What are you doing that you've got to be girt about? Okay? You're facing a, a world full of half-truths and lies that need to be combated. Somebody needs to stand against and stand for the truth. And you will take blows for that. But that's not fun in our comfortable, polite society, in our culture, where we serve our pleasures and affections of our own old man. That's not comfortable to do that. So we, yeah, we'll forget that one. Breastplate of righteousness, okay? Uh, your feet shod with the preparation of gospel of peace, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. The wicked. Who is shooting you? Who is firing things at you? Nobody. <laughs> if you're not talking to anybody about anything. <laughs> Nobody if you're not standing up for the truth. Nobody if you're not doing a work for the Lord. Uh, the point was made earlier that you aren't trying to be offensive to people. As a Christian, your job is to stand for truth, do the work of the Lord. It's not your place to be offensive. However, what you're saying and doing will likely be offensive to a world, to people who have rejected truth and rejected God. That's going to happen, folks. You need this armor if you're going to do the work. If you're not going to do the work, leave it there. You're not going to need it. You're not going to face this stuff. You say, this kind of sounds like he's going into some heavy artillery fighting here. I mean, he's going to really protect himself from stuff. Yeah, not if you're not fighting it. Not if you're not participating in the battle. You will not need this ever. And in 21st century America, you could live your whole life without it. It wouldn't be a problem. And thank God I'm saved and I'm going to heaven, but I, I don't have time for that. I got soccer practice and I got groceries and co-ops and I got, I mean, all this stuff. But we're servants of Christ, not of men. And that's the point. And when you become a servant of God, you will need this stuff. When you stand for it, you will face the persecution for it. The world doesn't want to hear the truth. Okay. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 is another, verse 1 and 2 is kind of another verse that we all shake, nod our heads at. Yep, that's us. Got that. If ye be risen with Christ, this is the new man, right? The resurrected life. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection. Now, we just talked about a while ago the old man's affections being crucified. So, what replaces it? Let's fill the vacuum. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Okay, so I just go around praising God all day, you know, like the evangelical worshipers do, you know, these praise bands. Now, you can make money as a musician being a music minister in a praise band. You can do that. They pay really well. Big churches. I, I got nothing. I got nothing. I was being, I was being facetious, okay? Setting your, uh, your affection on things above, that, that is not just me, you know, that you're milling over God all day. I mean, it wouldn't hurt, okay? But your affections, the things that you care about, the things that you spend your time and your money and your effort, and the things, the things that you do in your life, the things that mean something to you, should be things above. Well, I don't know. What's things above? Well, you know God's up there, and you know God gave you some instructions, and he's got some work that needs to be done because there's a battle going on in this world. Maybe you could start there. Maybe the affections that you could have could be on the things that God from above need done right here so that in eternity things are going to happen the way that God wants them. You need, to help with, you need to help out with that. It's the duty that we're talking about here. Okay? You, this does not make you a Christian. People, people will be in heaven who haven't done a lick of work for the Lord. And they're saved and praise God for it. Okay? That he was even able to save lazy bums. Okay? But that's not the duty that God has called us to. God has called us. We've been enlisted. I think I wrote on your, uh, in your outline. Whether you like it or not, you've been enlisted into battle. You have been called to be a soldier. 2 Timothy chapter 2. There's a reason why we often say that we should commit these things that we're learning to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also in chapter 2, verse 2. We say that because of chapter three and four, or verse 3 and 4. Therefore, endure hardness. With all of that armor, you're going to need to do that. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ, there's good there for a reason. It's not endure hardness as a soldier of Jesus Christ. The good soldier, the one who's done a good job of being a soldier, endure hardness like that guy. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life so that 
he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. Okay, that's why we do it. We often talk about the, uh, the judgment seat. Paul brings us up in 1 Corinthians 3. I think that's on the outline even. This whole idea of precious stones and rubies and wood, hay, and stubble. And it's all going to be tried by fire. What is that stuff? You know, what is it? How, do, how does that all work? What does that look like? I thought we had all spiritual blessings. Right? Another question. Think of it like this. God, the commander-in-chief, has enlisted all saved persons. Now, there's no requirement. You're a saved person. He's a, but, but he has enlisted you into this war. Okay? Someday, we will all report to the commander-in-chief from our post. Reporting from duty, sir, this is what I did in my post. Some people will be like, say what? I was on a post? I was supposed to be doing what? They, they're completely clueless. Shame on us who know that we have a post and aren't doing the work required of a soldier on a post. And we get this right here, that we are soldiers for God left here in this world to do a work. And we report back to him. And he will judge, discern. He will look at the work that was done or not done. And he'll say, good soldier, nice job. I think you're prepared, you're meet, you're apt to do this job here. Good for you. Soldier, what'd you do? Uh, I, I know I was a soldier. I, what are you talking about, God? I'm saved. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let me get out my guitar. Okay. Uh, yeah, that really was unproductive and a waste of time. You are really not going to be able to do that over there, so we'll put you over here. Yeah, thanks. Take out that garbage. I mean, there are, jo- there are vessels to dishonor, folks. I mean, read the book, okay? <laughs> there are jobs to be done that aren't quite as honorable as other jobs that need to be done, eternally speaking, okay? That's what we're talking about. He's going to judge the work and discern it and say, okay, there's work that needs to be done up there too. And this battleground is the preparation that we have to fulfill the duties that we will be doing for eternity. Uh, so it's kind of your choice whether you want to be in this position, or taking out the garbage. In heaven, all of us praise God, okay? I hate taking out the garbage, all right? I would much rather do something besides the dishes, all right? And so we strive for that. And it's not, it really, the, the motivation is not that so much as it is this. Ought we not to please and be approved, as he says later in the chapter when talking about studying, approved of the one that sent us to do the job. My wife is an amazing cook. I mean, chef level, okay? If she were as good in front of a camera as she is in the kitchen, she could rule Food Network, okay? Yeah. But one time I decide that I am going to make dinner for her. On, you know, she does this all the time for me. I'm going to do it for her. Paul talks about in Philippians that we should work out our salvation our salvation with fear and trembling. And people say, wait a minute. Paul said in Timothy that we are not given the spirit of fear. What is Paul like schizophrenic again? What's he talking about? Okay, this is what he's talking about. When I'm preparing that meal for my wife, culinary expert, she can taste exactly every step that you did. Every ingredient in there, she will know when she takes a bite. Okay, I am sweating over this recipe. Because I am not a good cook. I do not know my way around like she knows her way around. I do not know which ingredients need to be put in there just because I can smell it. Okay? I can't do that. But because I want to give this to her, I want to do this in a response to her always doing this for me, I want to give something back to her, I want to make this meal. And I make this meal with fear and trembling that it's going to be terrible, that it's going to fall apart, that it's going to be burnt, that it's not going to taste right, that she's going to hate it. And it sits there on the table, and I'm waiting for her to come home. And I'm going like this the whole time. I don't know that's going to be good enough. I, that, I know it's not going to be good enough. That is the best that I could have done. She comes in, she eats it. Now, I know that before she takes a bite, my relationship, my standing with her, will not change based on the bite that she takes. I know this, okay? Now, some of you may not be that lucky. <laughs> I am. Okay, and I know this. Okay, so I know that she will take a bite of that food and it may taste terrible and she's not going to hate me or change the way she relates to me because of it. She might ask me not to do that ever again. (laughs) But that's beside the point, okay? 
The point is, this is what I'm talking about. Our response to someone who has done something for us is that. And we work out our salvation on, in this life for the one that has given it to us in the same manner that I work out that meal that I'm trying to do for her because of what she does, to, does for me. And I do it in such a way that I want it to be right and I want it to be, I want it to be the way that she would want it to be. And that's our response to the Lord. How does God want us to live for him here in this life? Okay, it's the same response. That's the fear and trembling that we have. Not because I'm scared of God, not because I think my position before him will somehow be diminished if I don't do a good job, not because I'm looking for a big paycheck in heaven, but because I can humble myself before him and understand the position that he's given me freely that I did not deserve that I now want to respond in some way, any way that I can, to do work for you. You say you want me to fight a battle down here? Fine, I'll do it. You say there's a war? Give me the sword, give me the shield. Let's do it. Let's get at it. That's a proper response, okay? To run with the liberty and to live in a comfortable way despite knowing what it is that God has given us to do is to shirk your duty despite the position you've been given. That is not to have the mind of Christ. Our position and our duty are two very important things. We have to understand them both in order for them to be effective for God. All right, well, let's pray and then we'll, we'll be finished. God, we do thank you for what you've done for us. And uh, I hope that as we've gone through the verses today that we can all realize from your word that our, our position that we have for you is unwarranted that the position you've given us, we don't deserve that at all. And at the very least, we could do is to serve you the best that we can, not to use that as an excuse, but to use that as motivation to really analyze how it is that we function in this world as ambassadors with your grace in our lives and the power that you've given us through your spirit to be separated from our old man and to not walk accordingly and serve him. So I I pray that as we move forward from today that we would uh, prayerfully consider how these uh, challenges come come forth in our own lives so that we can bring uh, bring fruit to you and please you uh, in that day. Amen.